So Charlie writes, no gods besides the solver? What are the other nine poker commandments, O oh, wise one? This time, I'm going to try to answer that. What's up, everyone? This is Alvin Teaches Poker. It's been a while, and I wanted to talk about what the road looks like for an aspiring player who wants to take their poker career from a amateur to a professional type grind. And that doesn't even mean developing a professional skill set, because obviously that is a very long-term and difficult investment, but simply adjusting to the mindset of what it actually takes to be an accomplished, successful, thoughtful, studied, and most importantly, winning player. So what does the path look like? For me, I originally was playing kind of the mid-stakes back in the Black Friday era of poker, and I really started struggling when I got to like 2-4 and 3-6 because a lot of my fundamentals were still kind of feel-based, and, and despite thinking that I had a very thoughtful understanding of what solid poker looks like, I've discovered now years later looking at solvers that uh, back then I had no idea what I was doing in 2008 through 2012. It's funny because I actually found a uh, article that I wrote for Bluff Magazine back then and I was reading that I was like, who is this clown? And then I was like, oh, I wrote this. <laughs> I was like, oh God, this is horrible. So there are a bunch of approaches that are probably not very reproducible. So <laughs> the joke I always make is if your poetry lessons and your poker lessons sound kind of similar, you're in trouble, which kind of means when people are like, ah, you kind of have to do what you feel in the moment, and it's very wishy-washy and kind of intuitive-based and very hippie, one, it's going to be very difficult for you to reproduce because even if this is a successful style, I guess we can call this white magic, even if you can, uh, even if white magic is profitable, which it has to be, right? Well, it's not, that's actually not debatable. White magic is very profitable. Is it easy to develop white magic? Previously on this channel, I talked about uh, an instance where one of my former mentors was playing against Daniel Negreanu, and something that was really overpowering was Daniel Negreanu's charismatic and social presence at the table, and that presence was so dominating that it got a bunch of tight players to kind of loosen up a little bit in terms of their demeanor and not be quite as aggressive and battle quite as hard. And so that constant, maybe emotional, uh, uh, stoning that he gives you by saying, oh, you know, you got me, or, oh, can you just fold this hand? You don't really have anything, or, oh, you know, maybe you don't really want to deal with me this time. You know, all of that kind of social presence kind of weighs on you, and you get this sense of emotional satisfaction when you get it off of your back by just folding your hand, and that kind of very subtle emotional relief probably adds up in terms of winning a bunch of big blinds with white magic. So, uh, but the problem is, can you teach that kind of Daniel Negreanu charisma to your average poker player? Probably not, especially because a bunch of us, including myself, are cave dwellers. So, um, I think things that are going to be very read-based or feel-based, like, oh, I feel like he's seed betting too much, is not really going to be a fundamental way to learn the game. So uh, what's really important is that not only can this path be reproducible, but it must be reproducible throughout your entire journey. And so this is what I think is the problem with the approach of some kind of, uh, I guess we'll call them beginner schools, is that they teach you a style that is uh, a style designed to get you to stop the bleeding, but not to actually win at the game. And if you have a style that is designed to stop the bleeding, one, it's probably a style that is mostly based on anecdotes and people telling them, oh yeah, one, two, I played like this and made a bunch of money one time, versus, again, having a very quantitative path. And so, uh, we're going to talk about solvers, obviously, but I really started having a lot of success in my game when I mostly just started focusing it on data. 
right? Looking at hand histories, looking at percentages, doing basic kind of poker math, and just going with it and having faith that the poker math was correct. Because, uh, you know, there's a lot of people who will say, oh, you know, if this guy folds X percent more than uh, the minimum defense frequency, you should bet any two cards. I actually do that in real life, but I didn't actually, actually start doing that even though I knew it was correct until I got a solver and said a solver says, oh yeah, bluff 100% of the time here. And you will actually find in real life, there's a bunch of situations where we know, wow, this guy is going to fold more than the alpha requirement for uh, our betting size to fold frequency, but we actually don't just bet all of our bluffs. Why is that, right? So having a quantitative path is going to be very important. Uh, there's this perennial question is, is limping preflop good? The answer, of course, is it depends. But what is very interesting is there are players who are long-term winners, even at the high stakes, who employ limping strategies. They don't employ limping strategies on the button. They mostly do it when they're like under the gun or in middle position. Um, and I guess they have found a way to play a preflop strategy that does not sacrifice that much EV, but also gets your opponent to be forced to study your lines. We'll talk about this in a little bit. So, uh, you know, the argument is, is limping good against players initially when they have not done deep study or players who are incapable of doing deep study, limping is probably very, very good against players who are extraordinary, who also have this kind of technological and intuitive ability to be able to battle your playing, it's probably not as good. And it's probably just also unnecessary at the small stakes. Small stakes probably don't need to limp. Um, but we can also look into a solver and see, if I limp under the gun, versus having, uh, you know, like a, a raise in strategy versus like an all, a pure limp strategy, how much EV am I going to be actually sacrificing against really, really good players? And if the answer is that you don't sacrifice too much EV, but you force your opponents into uh, different parts of the game tree, essentially what I like to uh, call new chess openings that your opponent has never studied, that you have studied very profoundly, then you are going to have an informational edge that you can manifest into money over the table. Um, being a good gamer, is essentially just being a very good scientist. And a lot of the times when gamers are not very accomplished, it's because they aren't good scientists, right? And so you need to be able to come up with hypotheses. You need to be able to analyze results. You need to be able to recognize your own biases. And then you actually need to be able to take the results and then to turn them into, in at least poker context, strategies that you can apply over the table, which actually is surprisingly difficult, as we will talk about in a, uh, in a little bit. But a lot of the times when players are kind of struggling, it's mostly because they have some sort of uh, fundamental belief systems about what good and bad poker is that shape their overall eagle eye thought process and actually prevent them from moving on to a, a higher plane of thought. And so David Serlin writes this book called Playing to Win. It's mostly about Street Fighter, but it also talks about like Starcraft, Magic the Gathering, all that crazy nerd shit that I, I really love. And it talks about this idea of a scrub. And so a scrub is someone who has mental obstacles that are that prevent him from actually being um, a really, really top tier player because a scrub is a player who's handicapped by self-imposed -impo rules that the game knows nothing about. That is, a scrub does not play to win. So, for example, there are some players who will say, oh, I should never do X or Y preflop ever, end of story. Usually when you have these kind of rigid thought processes like this, these are really good stepping stones to allow you to build up to more advanced concepts, but very often they will still handicap you because you're not thinking about um, poker in a very kind of fluid and wholesome uh, way. I always think about writing parallels. You know, when we when we talk about what is good writing, we have a lot of these very standard precepts. 
show don't tell, organ, you know, like organize your information in a logical manner, have storytelling come to a very satisfying conclusion. Um, and then you get into like more detailed techniques such as if you are revealing a plan and it fails, you can reveal the entire plan. But if the plan works, don't reveal it, right? Essentially, that's the entire description of Ocean's Eleven, right? But as you develop this kind of toolbox of techniques, you also have to be aware of what techniques are stopping you from breaking through and reaching this other level of genius. And I know that this is such a very kind of nebulous way to describe poker, but you know, very often people will say, oh, I don't limp or I don't donk. Okay, this is probably the best example. Everyone says, oh, if you have a donking range, you're an idiot. Or if you min bet, you're an idiot. Well, now that we have solvers, it actually shows that donking in a lot of spots is really good. Uh, and then min betting in a lot of spots is really, really good. And so if you're playing against opponents whose definitions of poker constrict them so that they think, oh wow, if this guy limps, or if this guy donks, or if this guy min bets, he's automatically the fish, then they're in deep, trouble, right? I think a great example of this is watching a Triton game. Tom Dwan sits down, sits down and the guy next to him in Chinese goes, oh, VIP, VIP, VIP. And I'm like, man, you look at Tom Dwan and sure, some of the things you see are him might seem crazy, but if you don't understand it, you don't realize that he's just on another level than you and you are about to lose your house. Especially at a, when you're playing for like a million dollars a hand, right? That's going to be super crazy. So it's really, really important to actually play to win and not create these rules about what is poker or what is good and bad poker that stop you from thinking about poker in this kind of like very free and flexible manner. The problem is it's very hard not to be a scrub, right? Like for the longest time, chess has been played in, you know, with all these kind of ideas of what good and bad chess is, even with all these chess engines. And then now we have whatever the Facebook chess engine is, Deep Blue or Deep Mind or whatever it is, or AlphaGo, right? And then it plays in these completely different ways where it is willing to sacrifice way more material than any other engine or human is used to, uh, only for strategic flexibility, which is something that is now being rediscovered by humans at the very, very highest level. But even you know computers, which were very, uh, which were designed by humans, and their original ideas of what good and bad poker was, or what good and bad chess was, right, were so limited that even with all of that computational power, right, in the end it does not play as good as what is more kind of this ultimate flexible, flexible neural network approach. Something that's also important is you don't want to climb very small mountains. Um, I can't think of too many examples about in poker off the bat. Maybe if you're developing a, let's say, C betting strategy that is simple, but very far away from an equilibria EV. That is, you know, let's say uh, with whatever strategy, I'm going to bet two thirds with all of my strong draws, open ended straight draws, gut shots, and hands that I want a triple barrel, right? That strategy compared to the EV of GTO is probably not going to be very good. I've probably I've looked at it. I've probably it's going to probably be like an 80 to 85 percent of the same EV as playing like a very very complicated GTO strategy. Um, and so like if you are the player who's like okay I want to learn how to master how to continuation bet with two thirds sizing on every board. That's something that's going to be a very small mountain once you discover that the optimal way to play a bunch of boards is to min bet instead, right? If you are a player who is limping because of all of the wrong reasons, and you're playing in a low stakes game and you're limping because, you know, when you raise aces, you're not getting enough respect and you don't know how to navigate multi-way pots, well, then you're climbing a very small mountain because you're just trying to avoid a larger problem that you're going to have to face in the long run anyways. And because you're gonna to have to learn how to play against pre-flop aggression very, very often and very, very immediately, once you move up to like even 50 or 100 no limit, there's no point in learning how to play a limping strategy until you are using it at a very high level with solvers and GTO to back up that kind of initial EV loss. One of the biggest differences between live players and online players besides the volume is that Online players have a database, and so 
using a database, having a good database, spending a lot of time in review and seeing what your opponents are doing is going to be extraordinarily important to any kind of quantitative approach to poker because obviously this is not a one-sided conversation and you have to be analyzing all of your opponents all of the time. I actually, because you know, when I play in American games, I play like uh, anonymous very often, so I don't know who my opponents are. So I spend a lot of time doing just general kind of statistical population analysis versus when I'm playing very high stakes games, I'm sitting with players who I know extremely intimately, so I don't really need to use a HUD against them because I just, you know, I, I know all of their tendencies because I've been studying every single hand with my rapt attention on a single table. Um, but so when you have an online database, it allows you to see where you are losing, where you are winning, and essentially you can see the same uh, results from your opponents. And so, you know, very recently I was looking at all of the regulars at 400 No Limit over at America's Card Room because I have some players who want to move up and uh, approach that stake. And the first thing I noticed is that all of them uh, seem to have a same, similar leaks, right? Like the metagame is just all revolving around uh, some of the similar leaks. And so, um, Spending a lot of time in your database is really, really important. And this is also important because, you know, even when we talk about uh, like live because of sample size issues, it's really hard to uh, adjust because you just don't really know if your opponent is going overboard in many situations. You know, when we say, oh, if a guy's C betting too much, we should just check raise his face off, it's really hard to realize if someone is C betting way too often over, you know, like two or three hours of hands. And so if you play online, and hopefully all of you guys are playing online because of the pandemic, please have a database. Please spend a lot of time investing on how to use it. There's just a ton of like YouTube uh, uh, videos on that. It should be pretty easy. But spending a ton of time in that and then taking the information that you see the database and putting it into pile solver that's really how you are going to crush your opponents very very uh wholeheartedly with very very powerful exploitative ideas something that's just really important for me is that uh you know i was trying to diet and i was just uh kind of half-assing it it's like oh i'm kind of eating more cleanly and uh, i'm kind of doing more workouts and you know guess what i was not losing weight very quickly and so uh, you know, I started taking the calorie logbook and, you know, doing like, you know, 1K deficit, then 500 calorie deficit, and then, you know, like logging all of my exercising, and then I lost 12 pounds in the last month. So, which is uh, probably uh, some water weight and probably uh, not sustainable in any regard. Um, but yeah, use a journal, <laughs> right? Uh, have the, uh, the equivalent of a poker journal. Uh, this is kind of going along with the idea of not um, being a scrub is that don't hold strange gods. And what I mean is don't idolize uh, a player, a coach, uh, anyone in the poker community and just take their word as gospel because you know the state of the metagame from the high stakes to the low stakes is still constantly changing as we develop new ideas with solvers and you know like I just have to admit like the way a lot of the higher high stakes players are playing doesn't look like how GTO would actually play even though I know some of them are trying to reproduce GP GTOs because simply put there's just a, a couple tactics that solvers use that really have not uh, made it into those games yet and so I would only hold a solver as my god right if I am very confident in my model making, which, you know, I'm like, eh, I'm probably like a, like an A, like an A, B plus, A minus model maker at this point, right? I'm sure there are people who are, you know, are, are much better model makers than I am, AKA they've just spent more time, uh, you know, with more accurate preflop solutions. Um, regardless, if you have access to good preflop ranges, a solver, and you know how to input a bajillion sizes, you can just learn how to play really, really good poker and teach yourself. Um, and you just never need to have any other coach, right? Once you have a solver and once you uh, invest the actual time to play like a solver in many situations, you will realize, oh, wow, uh, yeah, I, I don't really need qualitative 
poker advice anymore, which is why I think that my approach is so attractive is because eventually, at the end, hopefully at the end of training with me, you can train yourself, right? However, that doesn't mean that you can't ignore what the best players in the world are doing. You know, like very often, despite all of the time that I've spent studying deeply in my cave by myself, that's really how I developed a lot of the style that I play. Um, I then started watching YouTube, seeing how other obvious solver poker players um, were playing, and I was, like, oh, I was saying, oh wow, uh, you know, Linus donks small, like one tenth of the pot in this spot, right? I've never looked at this one tenth, uh, you know, uh, pot size bet. Or oh, you know, uh, Steven Sondheim uses this this bet size over here. I should maybe try and see, you know, what what kind of doors that unlocks. And so. By looking at masters, looking at their bet sizings, and looking at their strategies, you can use that as a really, really strong kind of starting point to developing your overall strategy, right? So I spend a ton of my time actually just watching YouTube videos of high stakes players, which isn't that exciting, but I'm just like, oh wow, they're playing in this way that I would not play. What are they doing? Why are they doing that? And I, in my opinion, that's how I developed very, very quickly. Uh, very similarly, when I first started uh, in my spoken word career, because as some of you may know, I'm a world champion slam poet, which is this kind of like proud and very embarrassing thing to say, the way I got good is, because this was pre-YouTube, rather than just, you know, like now, I would just like, you know, like Google YouTube and just like look up who is really good, I just had to like buy DVDs of previous national champions and then learn and study, uh, you know, from those people and just assume that those people were really good and that's what the metagame looks like. And so then when I went on to compete at like the national youth circuit, I was competing against all these people who had never studied any of these national adult masters and so then I just had a huge edge over them. Similarly, if you spend a lot of time studying really, really good players and watching how they play, not necessarily, you know, like listening to their coaching or looking at their explaining, but actually just seeing what they're doing when the money is on the line, you will learn a ton, a ton of things. You know, one, you know, one of the biggest um, ways that I have been studying multi-table tournaments is simply opening a pre-flop solver and looking at ICM. Uh, models and then watching people play scoop like 10ks right that have like Henry you know Henrik Henriksen is that his name or Henrik Highland I can't remember his name but he's like a huge crusher from uh, Europe um, Henry Hecklin I think that's his name um, but just watching these like uh, you know final tables you know with like Linus and Mike Zhang right playing very very high stakes and watching what they are doing with their pre-flop play you learn very very quickly right oh wow i maybe i should be folding deuces under the gun uh you know seven handed with 15 big blinds or something something like that i actually don't know if that's true but i think i would probably do that right now um regardless one of the uh i guess lines that was important in my, I guess, understanding of incorporating both GTO and exploitative play together was watching Goosecore, who is a player who I uh, give enormous respect to, who I think is extraordinarily talented. Um, you know, I saw Goose RFIs, ace-queen suited, and the cutoff of small blind flats. The flop comes queen to five. Goose bets a third, and the dude check ruse is huge. And without even thinking about it, Goose just folds. And he goes, yeah, what is this guy check raising me with? <laughs> when I have like ace queen of spades and there's a spade on the board and block blah 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 and you know that's a spot where I probably I hem and I haw and I go oh I'm exploitable if I do x and y and give all my reasons just pay this dude off when he has fives right and this was very eye-opening because it made me realize wow I'm a scrub here right this is a spot where I know my opponent pretty much has a set but I'm gonna still give him money because I'm a scrub Right? So watching this hand kind of unlocked something for me, saying, oh wow, when I just think my opponent is really, really imbalanced in a very obvious manner, I can just play extraordinarily exploitable because my opponent is playing in an extraordinarily, extraordinarily exploitable way. God, this video is going to be so long and I've only gotten through two of my bullet points. <laughs> Learning basic mechanics. I mean, this should actually be pretty easy. So as soon as you decide that you want to take poker seriously, 
Obviously, you have to learn the things like pot odds, outs, the basic equations, optimal bet sizings, etc., etc., etc. But the, the real reason that you learn all of these kind of uh, basic poker and GTO fundamentals is not because you actually use them at all over the table, right? It's extraordinarily rare that after my opponent makes, you know, X or Y bet, that besides just looking at, you know, the bet size to the pot to, to kind of figure out how many, what percentage of hands I need to fold, very rarely am I trying to calculate implied odds or pot odds, in, in, you know, in the moment. Right? A lot of my strategy is going to be preformed so that when I'm sitting at the table, I don't have to spend a lot of time doing all this like intensely rigorous calculation. However, you need to know all of these things very deeply because then you're eventually going to get a solver. Okay? And the problem with a solver is that it doesn't have a mouth. Right? It's the Terminator, or it's Skynet at least, because I guess the Terminator has a mouth. But it's Skynet. It just tells you how to destroy the world. But it doesn't tell you how or why. It just tells you the what. <coughs> Excuse me. And so when you learn all of this game theory and all of the, this kind of like mathematical background, essentially what you are doing is bolstering your ability to translate and justify why a solver plays in this manner and chooses Right, for example, to double overbet occasionally with Jack Eight suited, or double overbet queens, right? But never jacks. Why is that, right? Why? What are the candidate hands for overbetting? You know, like why do we pick these kind of combinations of hands? Why is it that the majority of these other sizings are going to be, you know, these kind of like mid-range sizes, and you know, we very rarely are going to be using min bets and twenty-five percent bets. To some people, this will obviously be, be very, very elementary, why we should be using a larger sizing on jack, eight, six, and be playing a mixed strategy versus like any kind of simplified or pure strategy. Um, but for some other people, this might not be intuitive, right? You might say, oh, wow, you're overbetting queens, but not overbetting jacks, right? Or you might just say, oh, wow, we should overbet queens. We should overbet hands of at least queen's strength or better which then might lead you to double overbet jacks, which is probably gonna be a huge mistake because of its blocker effects, right? Meanwhile, we should definitely put sixes in our double overbetting range or, or whatever overbetting size range because of its unblocker properties, right? So when you are learning all this math, it's really to focus on translation. And so if you, are, if you have a solver and you are you know, pretty good at making models, or at least, you know, and when I say being good at making models, I just mean giving your models enough strategic flexibility, right? When you isolate, you know, like I'm trying to isolate the flop, uh, you know, strategy to be pretty accurate. So I just, you know, give the turn and river don't have to have like a million sizes, right? To have like a pretty good flop strategy, as long as I give it the strategic flexibility of being able to go, you know, like small, medium, large, and overbet and still have like all ins, different race sizes, you know, the ability to donk small, et cetera, et cetera. And really this is just a question of how powerful your computer is, right? Like when we say good model making, it's that and then having good preflop ranges, which really is just a matter of getting simple, uh, you know, simple preflop, right? If you just want to have good ranges, you just uh, get simple preflop and then you just create ranges, right? So. Um, again, that is just a matter of computing power and time. Um, if you are, so if you're getting coaching and you're getting training after you have all of these other kind of um, you know, research tools in place, that training only should be to get better inputs, which is going to be um, finding better places to use better sizings, also uh, having better preflop uh, ranges and then translating outputs, which basically means when you look at this ridiculous strategy, what, what methods do you have to turn this into a playable strategy, right? So first off, there's gonna be a couple of examples is, you know, we don't have to play 10 sizings on the flop, right? That is obviously going to be impossible for us to manage and the 
chase towards trying to play this wild strategy is actually going to make us lose money because we're going to not be able to re reproduce it. So we can probably simplify this down to two or three sizings if you want to get kind of cute, right? And still have a lot of the EV that you would get from playing this kind of mixed strategy, right? <laughs> this was taking forever to solve, so I just didn't, <laughs> I didn't solve it completely down. But, you know, this is going to be fairly accurate. When you learn preflop ranges, uh, more or less is just going to be pure memorization. And to be honest, uh, you know, when I play, I try to use charts as often as possible, even though I've, I'm pretty confident at this point facing multiple race sizes. I generally know what the preflop strategy is. But you still are probably playing too passively in a lot of spots, every single one of you. <laughs> right in your preflop ranges you probably uh have way more three betting in gto land and so something i'm always trying to do is just push and push and push and make sure that i am playing as accurately as possible you know like i i have like kind of like 200 no limit ranges but obviously i have my own like personal like deep cook solves where i play with like much more higher kind of gto accuracy um and again all of your post flop strategies is going to be turning noise into useful action rather than just getting more noise right so as you begin to study and just you know click buttons essentially and see how you know the approach should look after a check back here the out of position player should over bet as its kind of primary sizing or go for like a much smaller sizing once you learn these general precepts bolstered by the theoretical knowledge that you've kind of been absorbing then you are going to be able to, um, you know, uh, label and categorize these strategies in ways that you can play them at the table. <laughs> I don't really know why I picked Kendrick Lamar, you know, but something that I, I talk about all of the time is your goal should be to take whatever these strategies are and use as many tactics as you can to make this playable for you while making it still very, very complicated for your opponent while not sacrificing uh, that much EV and, uh, compared to a very optimal, strategically flexible strategy. So, you know, like, let's say, you know, like uh, EV of perfect mix of a strat is $100, right? Our goal is to be able to figure out a strategy that is going to essentially get, eh, I say that this is about the threshold uh, nowadays of simplification that I'm going to be happy with is as long as you lose under 1% in most positions compared to, you know, like the perfect mix, you're going to be fine, right? First off, you know, if obviously the mistakes that your opponent makes against the 100% strategy is the same mistakes he's going to be making against the 99% strategy. If he overfolds, if he calls too much, right? And so that actual difference from an exploitative standpoint is not really going to be that, that different. Also very often is that, you know, when we talk about exploitable and, you know, the imposition's max exploitability, right? That is assuming that you are a nemesis opponent, AKA that you're omniscient and that you know all of your opponent's exact strategies. And that really is not going to be the case. You know, very often when I'm playing against players and they just are like, oh, you see bet 100% of the time, I just check back once in a while and then there's going to be some spots where instead of playing a hundred percent strategy i just play the 85 percent or 90 percent strategy that is uh, actually quote unquote optimal and then my opponents are baffled as fuck because they saw me check back in a spot where they assumed that i always bet and then now they just have no idea what i'm doing because i'm still betting the overwhelming majority of the time but they know that i sometimes have some checkbacks Right? And so, well, <laughs> maybe I'll just show them a check back one time and then just continue just simplifying against them relentlessly. But once I've just screwed with my opponent's idea about what my initial strategy is, then they're obvious, they obviously can never be a nemesis against me because they just don't know what I'm doing. Right? Um, I think previously, you know, there were, uh, I know that, I don't remember his name, but there was a cash game course that came out 
uh, from I think like a Brazilian player. Uh, and so he was originally advocating that simplifications could go to 98%. But uh, I think over time, as people have had like deeper souls and had more time to actually look at what the accuracy is, we can actually look for about 99% simplifications. And so that is about the bar that I am kind of advocating nowadays. Um, and so if you find something that is like 98 or 97% of like a multi bet sizing GTO, eh, you probably can improve it. This is particularly true, I would say, with turn barreling and river barreling strategies, because very often those are going to be extraordinarily complex, and obviously you can't create um, universal catch-all strategies for every turn and every river in the game. And so having some kind of heuristic that you know that captures 99% of the EV, 99% of turns, right, is going to go a long way in terms of making your like barreling in general, you know, like theoretical understanding of the game very, very strong. Right, so 99% threshold is what I am generally looking for when I'm trying to create a slightly easier strategy because again, you know, I can't, you know, I can't play all of these like super, super crazy strategies and frankly, no human can. Um, <laughs> uh, I used to actually be quite good friends with this guy, Internet Poker, who was Jungle Man's roommate at the time. And, and it was crazy because then I'd be watching him play like 50, 100 heads up um, uh, on like Full Tilt Poker. And he was just, you know, like a really, really insanely talented player. And so I was like, man, I'm, you know, playing like one, two to three, six. I would love to make it to your stakes one day. What do I need to do to make it to this level? And he said, oh, it's very easy. All you do is you make a list of 10 things that you are not very good at that you need to work on. And when you sit down and play, you focus on the first three things on that list. And as those three things begin absorbing, then you go through the four stages of competence, which are like, what is it, unconscious incompetence, when you don't know that you're an idiot, conscious competence, when you know you're an idiot, conscious, I'm oh, sorry, conscious incompetence when you know you're an idiot, conscious competence when you are thinking really hard um, on something in order to be good at it, and then unconscious competence where you can just do things very fluidly. For example, you just know, you know, like the cutoff RFI range, like the back of your hand. All right. So you go through this list and you take these first three things and you drag them through the four stages of competence, and then you know how to do them. And they're locked in there, and they're just completely unconscious. You don't have to think about them. And then now you move down to the next three things on the list. And when you finish that list, you make a new list. And when you are unable to make lists, you hire a coach to make a list for you. And when your coach can't make a list for you, you are probably playing at very, very high levels of the game, where even then you probably still have things to work on, and you should now find peers to kind of talk to you about what are your biggest leaks, right? Um, I know that sounds really easy, but that is actually something that I really took to heart when I was young and was working on a bunch of different kind of skills. And that is just really how I proceed through the game. So if you are at this kind of like amateur or semi-pro level, or if you, you know, haven't gotten a solver, you have solver, the first thing I would do is just make a list of like 10 things that I'm not really good at, and then systematically go through them. Recording, logging, right, improving. Very systematic. I think that's something that, again, is important with being reproducible, is that if you don't have a system, hard to get better. Right? Um, I've kind of already talked about this, but the main ways that I study my opponents is that I do mass data-based analysis, and I look to hand-to-note. Hand-to-note is pretty much the, you know, it's the gold standard of HUDs and database analysis. It, it, you can use it for mobile games. You can use it for, um, you know, like online games. It doesn't work for global. But pretty much it, it allows you to do really ridiculous analysis of your opponent's ranges, their sizes. Um, if you play on Ignition, which allows for hands to be revealed 24 hours after, you actually get to see what your opponents are bluffing and betting with, with their hands face up without showdown bias, which is just really, really nasty. And it's really, really good because then you just get a sense of how Americans are playing and then you can go over and play over on like 
non face up sites and you'll be like oh these i i know how you guys play because this is what the american metagame looks like so once you get like a really really kind of uh you know feel on how to crush the ignition games really hard you'll find that the global and america's card room games yeah they you know like a lot of those kind of like mid stakes players have some very similar leagues you know i like two five and five ten um uh just as a uh as a, as a note i don't make any money or have any affiliation with hansi note i just think that they are by far way better than everything else something i also kind of want to address is that i while i use hand to note i actually don't play with a hud and the i actually haven't played with a hud in maybe four years it's funny because when i came back to poker my uh my first mentor who originally was one of my students was just like oh yeah you know you don't really need a hud just take notes I was like, what do you mean take notes? And this was a guy who was playing like Poker Stars Zoom 500. <laughs> and I was just like, you don't use a HUD? He's just like, yeah, I just kind of take notes on these guys. And I was looking at what notes he was taking and they were very simple, right? It was like 2.5 big blind RFI cutoff. I was like, what, you took a note on that? And then another time this guy opens four big blinds after we had a note that he opened like 2.2 big blinds. And I was like, oh, that's kind of interesting. Obviously that's going to be really rare at Stars 500. But taking these kind of just very, very standard notes, just see, are my opponents doing uniform things, right? And give and, de and developing your sense of, you know, like what hands your opponents are opening uh, from, different uh, from different positions is going to actually just be way more accurate than using a HUD, right? If I see a dude open jack two suited from middle position, I don't need a HUD. I already like I don't need to wait ten hands to see that this guy is going to be a you know a total moron at the table. I immediately can begin to act on that, right? Now, obviously, even with a hunt, uh, you should be acting on it if you see a guy opening that loosely, you know. But you get the idea. Is that very often if you are focusing on taking notes about these very basic things and forcing yourself to just pay attention all the time. You're going to very quickly learn about how your opponents are playing and be able to adapt to them much, much faster than using a HUD, which is going to often be very inaccurate, right? Like, you know, there's so many stats that you just need a ridiculous amount of data on, right? A lot of the data is very, needs to be, like, really, really contextualized, right? Like, you see, oh, this guy three bets in position, but he three bets you, you know, in position when you're opening under the gun and you're a nit. Is it still going to be that 13%? I don't really know, right? So I really like taking notes. And um, again, you know, haven't taken, uh, haven't used the HUD in a long time and it has not um, failed me and I don't think I'm ever going to go back. Um, the final note is actually a note that another coach gave me, which I thought was really eye-opening and makes me kind of reassess what um, the correct approach or not the correct approach or, or what is it that the poker students need to make it to greatness and he said although the truth of the market is more complex many red chip poker upswing best poker coaching players they just trade programs until they find one that emotionally fits for them as soon as chris said this i was like wait that's really really true and so i think you know if you're like a, if you're a red chip uh customer i think your your motto or the kind of the ethos of that place is um learn to not bleed everywhere right they don't teach you to be crushers by any regard and i don't think that any of them will ever say that they will teach you how to be crushers they teach you how to not dump money at horrific rates right um, similarly, there's going to be some other schools that teach overwhelming complexity, right? And they get their rocks off on being like, oh, we're more complex than everyone. So that is the best way to, uh, to go about it, right? Again, as we've talked about um, up here about not being a scrub, the point of poker is not to be as complicated as possible. It's to make as much money as possible. Right, and so when you are looking at, at training and you know, like 
developing a general philosophy about playing to win, you have to remember that you know there is no flag that just says the most complex strategy is the best one. There's, similarly, there is no flag that says the simplest strategies are the best one. Right? You should just be only playing what is the most profitable for you, which is kind of like dieting. You should do the diet that actually works with you that you can stick with. But so I think why my approach is different is that I only use data in my approach and it's, it's successful, right? Like, you know, very recently we had a player who was like uh, playing like 25 no limit or something. Yeah, this guy. This guy lost $1,300 playing 25 no limit and now he's just walloping people, which is kind of cute. You know, we've had a bunch of guys move up from like the micros and small stakes, and we've had a couple of people move up three to four stakes in the last year or two, which is like really, really fly. And then obviously, uh, you know, <laughs> some of the, you know, the top players over at Overnight Monster are somehow getting Fader Holtz to call off Ace Queen uh, in this formation. I'm not really sure what's going on here, Fedor. Similarly, my boy is getting Lucky Boys to put in. Uh, money with not the toppest pair. I don't know how this, I don't know, I really don't know how this went in, but good job. So, um, you know, hopefully this, hopefully this has not just been like two hours of me talking and I'll, I'll just turn this off in the first five minutes. But, you know, this is philosophically the overall approach that I think players need to take in order to have a reproducible path from the small stakes to the high stakes. You hold no gods, you listen to solvers, you incorporate mass data and your um, hand-to-note analysis into PyoSolver, you learn how to translate uh, PyoSolver into executable strategies through um, a reasonable amount of simplification that does not lose a ton of EV, and then you create a list of all of the things that you don't know how to do and you slowly work through that list and the different competences, right? And this is like pretty easy once you have a solver. You're just like, oh, I don't know how to play four bet pots out of position, cut off versus small blind, right? Well, fire it up. Once you fire it up, you can be like, okay, cool. Small blind needs to lead on X, Y, Z flops and it needs to, right? Like, you know, check call and check raise on X, Y, Z flops as well, right? And once you just go through that list and go through all these formations and you'll, become a very solid, very, very strong player very, very quickly. Um, and you'll be able to do it mostly by yourself. So hopefully this was useful to you guys. Please stay safe. Take care of yourself. Take care of the ones you love. I'll talk to you soon.